to a clicker exercise? So it's actually not that dramatic a difference. That's only four points, even though it looks like it's a gigantic difference. Something is wrong with this program. OK. All right. So most of us went through that. That's the heritage of what we're talking about today. OK. All right. <laughs> There's, there are some problems. So I don't think that we think as clearly about sexuality as we think we think. Um, there are still issues, but that's for later on in the course. So what I want to show you is how the ideas towards virginity evolved, particularly focusing on the Virgin Mary. The New Testament says little to justify the worship of Mary. It denies the claim of Mary's lifelong virginity. So Matthew is the only evangelist to make a clear statement about the virgin birth. It was actually a problem for the early church, this idea that Jesus was born of a virgin birth, because the classical world, the pagans, had all kinds of stories about people born of virgin births whose fathers were gods. And one way of dealing with this was the church actually made a dogma of the perpetual virginity of Mary. And the story of Mary's assumption up into heaven um, doesn't appear until the second or third century of the current era. According to the Eastern Orthodox tradition, Mary died while surrounded by the apostles in Jerusalem. And then later, in a repeat of the Jesus story, when they opened her tomb, they found it empty, and they assumed that she had been assumed bodily up into heaven. The most important storytellers traditionally were the painters, because not everybody could read. Reading was a, um, a, a skill that only the elite acquired. And so the stories were associated with, with pictures, and pictures interpreted those stories. So for instance, here's a painting of the assumption of Mary, the open tomb, the angels lifting her up into heaven. So here's an early one from the 15th century of Mary being lifted up into heaven, uh, a mosaic image. And this is one of the most famous ones by Titian, not that long after, but a dramatically different sense of style. And here's an even more, you can see the, the cloud again now, um, Rubens, an even later one getting more and more dramatic. The cult of Mary and the worship of Mary is at its height in the early medieval period uh, in the 12th century. Um, and that it is associated with the Crusades, with the rise of the Crusades. And with this emphasis on Mary, not only that you need to preserve her tomb in Jerusalem, but that she's queen of heaven and develops. And so you start to get all these images of Mary being queen, crowned in heaven, these royal images. I love Fra Angelico, so I always try to include him, if I can, um, of Jesus crowning Mary again. The theological sort of idea behind raising Mary and giving her such a high status in the church was this idea that Mary was, quote, the new Eve who said yes to God as Eve had said no. So this di distinction between what holy women should be and fallen women are. And so here it is. You see in the background Adam and Eve being uh, expelled from paradise. And then in the foreground, you see the assumption, the angel appearing before Mary. So these ideas would be represented in pictures, in paintings for people to absorb. OK, the Desert Fathers were Christian ascetics who lived in the deserts of Egypt beginning around 200. And the most famous of the Desert Fathers is Saint Anthony. He was born near Egypt to wealthy parents. He went to church where he heard Matthew 19:21, If you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasures in heaven. And come, follow me. And he decided that's what he would do. The devil fought with St. Anthony by afflicting him with boredom, laziness, and, of course, fantasies of women and sex. So this is a real early image of St. Anthony. Mostly, the devil comes in the form of a woman. And so this idea is already pretty strong there. Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, the temptations of St. Anthony. It is a triptych, and this is St. Anthony going into the desert. Those are the fantasies. Another extremely cool painting <laughs> um, to show you how this goes all the way up to our era. And again, you see the woman and wealth and power 
all of these things, and St. Anthony here warding them off with the cross. And among those people who were influenced by St. Anthony's, the life of St. Anthony, was St. Jerome, who was an educated Roman born of Christian parents. That red cloak on the ground is one of the signs of St. Jerome in a red hat. But when he's in the desert, um, he couldn't be dressed in other things. But what will tip you off that it's St. Jerome is the book. The book is crucial. Here's St. Jerome again in the desert. Supposedly, he could talk with animals. He was sympathetic with animals, that he took the uh, thorn out of a foot of a lion and thereby tamed the lion. But here's an El Greco painting again of St. Jerome, the penitent in the desert. That's what people would look at when they went into church. Again, you'd see that and you'd get the story of St. Jerome. Even if you couldn't read, you would know this story. But what I'm interested in today is this metaphor that permeates Jerome's writings, that the virgin is the bride of Christ. He writes in a letter to a, a virgin, always allow the privacy of your own room to protect you. Always let the bridegroom play with you within. Do you pray? You speak to the bridegroom. So he went to Jerusalem where he used his scholarly skills. He took the existing Latin translation of the New Testament and improved it, and he translated the Old Testament into Latin so that those who were educated could read the Old Testament. These are the other common Im images that you find of St. Jerome, um, always in his red robe, usually with his book, here the translator. Oh, and here's one by Caravaggio where he tries to put together the scrawny desert St. Jerome with the translator St. Jerome. Um, again, the idea of death um, being something you meditate on with the skull. These two streams of the Virgin Bride of Christ and the Desert Fathers tend to come together in Catherine of Alexandria. Again, very, very early. According to the legend we have, Catherine was the daughter of the governor of Alexandria, and her mother was a secret Christian, but she sent her daughter in to the de meet with the desert hermit. And the desert hermit told her of Jesus, and right after that um, meeting, Catherine had a vision in which she was baptized, transported to heaven, and betrothed to Christ by the Virgin Mary. Here she's betrothed to the infant Christ, um, which is an interesting idea. Sometimes it's the mature Christ. And then she said to have gone to Rome to convince the Emperor Maxentius to stop persecuting Christians. So then he ordered that she be executed, tortured to death on the wheel. But when they tried to put her on the wheel and she touched it, the wheel broke. So they beheaded her. And the angels are, are said to have carried her body to Mount Sinai. In this early period, um, and quite up until just pre-modern times, Catherine was a major figure. Here she is represented with Matthew, representing the gospel teachings, and then John the Baptist. Um, again, the uh, model along with Anthony for the desert ascetics. Each one of them has their own um, symbol. The broken bits of wood at the, on the ground beneath Catherine are the wheel that broke apart. She is a figure, a symbolic figure that pulls together these traditions that was alive for early Christians. Here's a more recent um, painting of Catherine of Alexandria where she's just a beautiful young woman that could appeal to anybody. In 1969, the Roman Catholic Church removed her feast day from the calendar on the grounds that there was no historical evidence that she'd ever lived. It was just a legend. And then, in 2002, they put her feast day back into the calendar. The church wrestles with these oral traditions um, and deciding which ones it supports and which ones it won't support. And their questions are, has learning about the debate in the early church over sacred virginity and celibacy changed your views? If so, how? Why do you think the Christian church adopted the teachings of sacred virginity and celibacy? I think that's a really crucial question. And I wanted to point out that sacred celibacy and virginity, particularly sacred celibacy for men, are um, teachings found not just in Christianity, but in Buddhism and, and Hinduism, but not, interestingly, in Judaism or Islam. And finally, do you think that religious institutions should have teachings about sex? Or is scientific information about human sexuality a sufficient 
moral guide. What do we say about all of the monks that live in communities, the, the, the sanghas, the little monkhoods all over, well, Southeast Asia, for instance? A lot of Jesus' teachings were like the golden rule and like love your neighbor and stuff. And how are we supposed to do that if we're all living in caves or on pillars? I guess they might think that they're helping other people by showing them a way to like live your life better. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to promote virginity or to promote virginity until you're married. I think that a church should teach about sexuality, but I agree that it should be on like a non-secular type way. Why does it have to be taught by our religious organization? There may be problems with that Catholic teaching, I agree with you completely, but there's problems with not having any teaching as well. You're given these boundaries that you're allowed to discuss things in, but you're not really supposed to go outside of those boundaries. <laughs> some type of something that sits down with children or teenagers and be able to talk to them about this and to listen to them. Now it's like perceived as sex is a <coughs> terrible thing and you know people are like scared of it and I don't like you're not going to go to hell for having sex you know you're not going to be eternally down for having intercourse with somebody. <laughs>